What do you picture when you think of the president of the United States? This? Hopefully not this. Or maybe something else entirely. A limo with a motorcade. Mount Rushmore. Harrison Ford on board Air Force One. An alien invasion that destroyed the White House but somehow missed Bill Pullman. Whatever it is you're imagining, it might be something grand. Something larger than life. Which makes sense. The American presidency is among the most powerful and visible jobs in the world. But it is still a job, even if it doesn't quite feel that way anymore. Every election, presidential campaigns seem to move further from substantive debates and closer to a casting call. Remarks about age, temperament, energy, looks, even the sound of a candidate's voice have all become commonplace. Policy debates take up less of our attention, while personal sniping and pointless controversies dominate headlines. I'm fulfilling, fulfilling the legacy of Barack Obama, and you're not. Campaigns have become less about what a president should do and a lot more about who a president should be. But that wasn't always the case. Elections used to be about policy and vision. So what happened? What changed? And if voters are no longer looking for a highly qualified candidate with good ideas, what exactly are they looking for? If the 2020 primaries are any indication, the one thing voters prioritize above all else? Electability. Everyone wants to pick a winner. We saw that phenomenon play out in real time as Democratic candidates rapidly dropped out and endorsed the perceived moderate Joe Biden over the more progressive Bernie Sanders, who was viewed as a riskier candidate. So where does this idea of electability come from? We know in 2020, at least, it came from fear. Fear of choosing a candidate who'd lose in the general, someone who'd make it easier for Donald Trump to win a second term. And so Democratic voters overwhelmingly chose Joe Biden, who also happened to be an old white guy and the former vice president. He was familiar. He seemed moderate. He felt like a president. But this idea of a candidate who can win, someone who feels like a president, does actually begin to hint at just what changed about our politics. Because as the American president has begun to feel more like a character on TV, the process of electing a president has begun to feel a lot more like a game show. And while it's easy to try to blame a guy like Donald Trump for this phenomenon, Trump was just the symptom of a culture that has come to value celebrity over all else. And he also wasn't the first president with celebrity appeal. What about John F. Kennedy, a young and handsome leader who wrote a newfound celebrity status to the White House? Or Ronald Reagan, he was quite literally an actor, mastering the look and feel of a politician while constantly cracking jokes with the press. Bill Clinton and Barack Obama had their moments as well. So to figure out how all this started, let's go back to the very beginning. The presidency was actually something of a contentious idea in the eyes of America's founders. The United States had only just broken off from England, and there was still a strong aversion to anything that looked even a little bit like monarchy. During the Constitutional Convention, people like Benjamin Franklin lobbied for multiple chief executives, a way to spread out executive powers. James Madison wanted something like an executive council, which would at the very least be independent of a president and keep him in check. But in the last few weeks of the convention, the idea of one president and the executive as one branch of government began to take hold. And by the end of George Washington's time in office, the presidency had become more powerful than what most of the founders had imagined. Still, it was a long time before the president went from being a mere political figure to the most famous person in the country. In the 19th century, Abraham Lincoln came close. He was viewed as sort of a mythical figure who'd saved the Union. In the 20th century, other presidents regularly captured the attention of the country for all kinds of reasons, good and bad, from John F. Kennedy's Camelot to Richard Nixon's Watergate. But it really wasn't until the 90s that the presidency went full Hollywood. On November 17, 1995, The American President was released, a love story starring Michael Douglas as the President of the United States. The film debuted to rave reviews and grossed over $100 million at the box office. It wasn't that the film had done anything particularly groundbreaking, but a movie featuring the President of the United States as a normal guy seemed to resonate with audiences. In the years following the film's release, Hollywood doubled down. Films in and around the White House were suddenly everywhere. Independence Day, My Date with the President's Daughter, My Fellow Americans, First Daughter, First Kid, Air Force One, Deep Impact, Wag the Dog, Absolute Power, you get the gist. In the glow of the American president's release, the film's screenwriter, a guy named Aaron Sorkin, decided to build on the world he'd created. He developed a television show built from the scraps of scenes that never made it into the film. In this new show, an ensemble cast of morally pure public servants would work in an idealized White House under a virtuous president. It would be a show that lived in the in-between moments, not just focusing on the president, but on his staff, both the work they did and what they sacrificed to do it. 
The West Wing first aired on NBC on September 22, 1999. It came at the tail end of a Clinton administration that aired towards centrist triangulation over bold liberalism, and just before eight years of George W. Bush. For liberals, then, the West Wing became a form of escapism, a democratic administration where the president and his staff didn't just say and do what they believed was right, but were more often than not rewarded for it. The show was one of the most successful television series of all time, winning nine Emmys in its first season alone. After more than 20 years, it's still constantly quoted, gifted, referenced, and clipped. It's spawned podcasts, been plagiarized in political speeches, and led to an entire generation's lofty political aspirations. And yes, that sort of includes me, since I was a college freshman the year it premiered. Have I cringed more than once while watching old episodes during the miserable, hellish political era in which we now find ourselves? Yeah. Absolutely. But it's actually pretty easy to figure out why so many people took to the show back then. It's full of great performances, camera work, and an incredibly distinct writing style. But what's always separated the show from the political dramas that would come later is just how optimistic it is. Every one of the main characters are genuinely good. They mean well, they work hard, they care about the American people. Sure, they make mistakes all the time, but only because they care so much. And President Josiah Jed Bartlett, the leader of this fictional White House, isn't just good, He's almost comically good. He's written to combat the usual complaints about liberal heroes. Bad with budgets? He's an economist. Attacking religious freedoms? He's a devout Catholic. Bartlett is kind but strong-willed. He commands attention, demands respect. He forgives people for their mistakes and gets Republicans to cross party lines with beautiful speeches. In fact, there's very nearly nothing wrong with President Josiah Bartlett, minus his decision to conceal from voters a potentially life-threatening autoimmune disorder, but I digress. As president, he combined JFK's New England Catholic sensibilities, Ronald Reagan's sense of humor, and Bill Clinton's policy wonkery and folksy charm. He's as presidential as anyone could possibly imagine. Because, well, he is imagined. The show documents President Bartlett's experiences through military conflicts, various political battles, controversies, a re-election attempt, and eventually his departure from office. Through it all, he and his team navigate treacherous political waters with long speeches, intelligent arguments, and a lot of walking and talking. Where are you going? Where are you going? I was following you. I was following you. The West Wing aired for seven consecutive, critically acclaimed seasons. And as its popularity grew, the lines between fiction and reality became surprisingly thin. In the final two seasons of the show, which aired after Sorkin's departure from the series, the campaign to succeed Bartlett kicks off. In the role of the Republican nominee, Alan Alda played Arnold Vinick, a moderate Republican senator who was modeled after John McCain. The Democratic candidate, Matt Santos, was played by Jimmy Smith. Santos is a young congressman from Texas full of hope, optimism, and bold plans. As the writers of the show set out to find someone to model him on, they actually landed on a young state senator from Illinois, a man who'd just given a speech at the Democratic National Convention. The hope of a skinny kid with a funny name who believes that America has a place for him too. As this fictional show mixed fantasy and reality, they somehow imagined what would soon become a very real presidential campaign in 2008. In a weird way, the existence of fictional presidents like Matt Santos, or Morgan Freeman's Tom Beck, Dennis Haysbert's David Palmer in 24, Tom Lister Jr.'s President Lindbergh, may have helped people imagine what it would be like to elect the first black president in the real world. Though, I will say, a script where the country elected a guy named Barack Hussein Obama just a few years after 9-11, would have probably been laughed out of the writer's room. A lot of times, reality is even stranger than fiction. But while elections may feel like a TV show, presidencies don't. After he won, Obama wasn't the star of a popular TV show. He was the president of the United States, which, believe me, is a whole lot less romantic than the West Wing makes it seem. I did not do a lot of fast walking and eloquent talking. I did a lot of sitting and typing. When I walked, it was down to the White House mess to get my 10th handful of M&Ms. When I talked, I could barely string a sentence together because I was so fucking tired all the time. The West Wing definitely got some stuff right, but it missed a lot. Because whenever the West Wing had to confront a boring or messy topic without a satisfying outcome, they could just skip over it, write it out of the show. We didn't quite have that luxury. As inspiring and historic as President Obama's election was, the day-to-day -day job of working in the White House wasn't nearly as glamorous, and sometimes it wasn't all that inspiring. It was hard and grueling, full of compromises that we wish we didn't have to make, and mistakes we couldn't always avoid. And that's not a critique of the Obama administration, that's the reality of governing. It's hard and it's sloppy and you can't always see the forest for the trees. 
There's no clean three-act narrative when you're trying to negotiate with Joe fucking Lieberman. But in the West Wing, a dramatic speech and a swell of music can save the day. But every time we think we've measured our capacity to meet a challenge, we look up and we're reminded that that capacity may well be limitless. The presenting sponsor of Crooked History is Dems, the first of its kind investment fund that through extensive research ensures you're only investing in S&P 500 companies that donate over 75% of their contributions to democratic causes and candidates. You can finally put your money where your vote is. Search for the Dems ticker, that's D-E-M-Z, wherever you invest or visit dems.fund to learn more. Carefully consider the fund's investment objectives, risk factors, charges, and expenses before investing. This and additional information can be found in the fund's summary or full prospectus which may be obtained by visiting dems.fund. Whew! Eight years after Obama's historic nomination, Hillary Clinton followed in his footsteps, setting yet another first for a major party nominee. Unfortunately, she faced every controversy imaginable and ultimately lost to an actual television star. You Actually, think you have a better memory than Dennis Rodman? I'm sure I do. And while everything from Jim Comey to the Russians to Pokemon Go has been blamed for Hillary's defeat, Pokemon Go to the polls! It's undeniable that the first woman to be nominated by a major party for president faced a barrage of sexism, the kind that women candidates face in real life and Hollywood. In fact, there's a West Wing storyline where the newly elected President Santos decides the idea of a female vice president is a step too far. She helps in Florida and then realize. She'll look like a symbolic choice. It's already a paradigm-breaking administration. I can't walk in here and start staffing the place like it's Noah's Ark. In the end, it's hard to deny that our politics today is rooted in some of the same perceptions the West Wing once leaned into. We expect our candidates to feel and act like those imaginary presidents. We expect them to command the media's eye without seeming desperate. Please clap. We want large rallies and rousing speeches, but nothing too cringy. Ah! We want someone who can crack a joke and nail a debate response, but it can't be too canned. Pass the torch. And sure, that's just the game of politics, but should it be? The West Wing helped build an archetype of an idealistic president who can deliver soaring rhetoric. And while you'll never get this guy to devalue the importance of an inspiring speech, we should be careful about overvaluing how a candidate speaks, how likable they may be, how presidential they may appear, or any of that other shallow stuff that's rooted in our own biases, unconscious as they may be. What's most important to the actual job of being president is a candidate's beliefs and values, a sense of empathy and humility, wisdom and judgment. The job of a president is a grind. It's full of compromises and difficult decisions, and there's rarely glory in any of it. Sure, every once in a while there's a fun day or an eloquent moment, but the times in between are anything but. And the people who are most qualified to sit in the Oval Office and push our country forward are not just reading lines. So it's probably best that we stop choosing them like they are.